I'm going to talk to you about you following the voice of God for you and getting to where you're supposed to be. Because more than ever before in this world, Jesus said we would have trouble, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. And the biggest thing that we need to know is that God is speaking to every one of us, every one of us. It was in 2017 that the Lord spoke to me and said, I want you to start going live every single weekday morning. That's back when we had five people watching. It was awesome. And you know what? I took care of those five people. I was uh, in a season where we were planting churches. We were doing all these things. And during that time, it was just me and Heather and Jason would come and encourage us, keep going. And I was just doing what he told me to do. And I'll tell you, I was messaging people personally. I was taking care of their needs, praying for them and all of it. And the Lord just suddenly kept watching, kept watching, kept watching. And then I had an angelic visitation, a, a legit one, not like the ones that go to heaven every five minutes and they're like, ooh you know, all that stuff, right? The Tickle Me Jesus crowd, which I enjoy some of that. Heather had that today. But <clears throat> I'm very much for Tickle Me Jesus. Woohoo, right? You know, I'm all about it. But I don't think that we should ever confabulate. I don't think we should ever do evangelastics. I don't think we should ever dishonor the spirit of the Lord by saying something he's not doing. And so that happens a lot in the angel experiences. And, and I had to get over this. And I think that's why an angel appeared to me. Because I, you know, I'd be in meetings, I'd be like, there's an angel right there. I'd be like, what does he look like? Go, what does he look like? And then they'd be like, oh, well, he's kind of like, I'm not, no, no, what does he look like? And then people are like, well, you know, he's kind of like a thing. You know? And so, is that too much? Everybody okay? I thought this was a prophetic meeting. So, so. So this angel did appear to me, and it wasn't like, oh, the glory. I screamed. <laughs> I should say when he appeared, it was more through a voice. It didn't materialize in front of me, and it roared through my being. And um, I'd finished this broadcast, and it roared through my being. And this is in 2019, or maybe at the very beginning of 20. It's hard to remember the exact moment now. But he roared through my being. Heather was in the room with me. And I'll tell you what, this thing said very clearly, said, I come from the great God, Jehovah, with a message. I am preparing you, he says, for a turning of the tide that is to come. And then he said, the great God of heaven does not need you as much today. You are more needed after the 2020 election is upcoming. And I'm like, what does that mean? He said, so prepare, your, your team's going to change, things are going to change. You need to get ready and continue broadcasting and told me about specific people, things that would happen. And then that was it. It just ended. And it so impacted me that I didn't speak about it for a long time because it was so dramatic. But the Lord began to lean into me about this daily live broadcast thing, this daily thing, this daily thing. That happened at that time. And of course, we all know what happened in 2020. Those things took place. But right before that happened, we had a full travel schedule. And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, uh, Joseph, you need to cancel every engagement you have. Cancel everything. Just you can't go. And so I talked to my team about it. And our, our executive assistant, who is with us today, was with us then. And I just said, what do you think about this? They said, I don't know why, but I'm bearing witness to this. We need to cancel everything. So we did. And the Lord said, cancel everything and get in the studio. When the pandemic hit, we were ready. We were ready. Everybody's saying, what do we do? Every church turned into a televangelist ministry. Friends, for your gift of any amount, right? It, it just turned into that, right? Anybody okay? And so, was that too much? Um, so, <laughs> man, I don't know. I, I, I think the Lord's still working on me with that sarcasm thing. <laughs> I'm getting through it in Jesus' name. <laughs> they say sarcasm is a metric for potential, right? Amen. So, I, I just began to recognize that the Lord had called me to do some things. He gave me a vision, a vision. Many of you have a vision. He gave me a vision to start and not stop. He gave me a vision and, and added tenacity to it. He gave me a vision and said, Joseph, this isn't about you. It's about the future generations. It's Psalm 102, for a generation not yet raised, that they may give you praise, Lord, that we do things now to affect things that we will never see in our lifetime. And that's our kingdom duty. That's our good and reasonable service. That's a living sacrifice unto the Lord. And so whatever it is God's called you to do, you know, 
first of all, you got to figure out if he if he's called you, and if you don't know, you got to figure that out. And you say, well, how do I do that? Here's my prescription for that, right? You're gonna want that cowbell, right? <laughs> Nobody, you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Nobody, anybody there? No. Some of you are like, what? Like, right? You want that cowbell? It's like, <laughs> I got a fever. And the only prescription is more cowbell. Nobody? Okay. Okay. That's a boom, boom. All right. Okay. For, forgive me. That's humor. So the Lord began to speak to me and said that there is a very big need, and many people don't know how to, how to hear God or know what he's calling them to do. My prescription for you is that you begin to dig into the Word of God. Read the Bible till it starts talking back to you. I'm all big on YouTube prophets. I is one. <laughs> but don't scroll the YouTube prophets. Go in your Bible and read it till it starts talking back to you. And you say, what does that mean? It means until your mind and emotions are overcome by the Word of God, the written Word of God, until the Word of God becomes a major factor, if not the factor, in all of your decisions, your convictions, your discernment, your emotions, how you feel about a thing. And now the word of God is talking back to you. Then you need to pray in tongues copious amounts of time. You say, what's an example of that? Well, some of my dear friends who have some of the biggest ministries in the world, they would pray in tongues anywhere from four to eight to 10 hours a day. And you say, why would you do that? Well, because tongues that builds you up according to the book of Jude is not tongues and interpretation that's equal to prophecy. Tongues that builds you up begins to invest in your future through the mechanism that God made you to be, through what he put in you. And you're beginning to water that. You read the Bible and you pray in tongues. When you're praying in your natural language, that's good. That is a good thing. You know, you don't want to sound like a lunatic to people all the time. If you're in church, it's like, I'm just praying, you know. Uh, can you imagine if everybody's at Thanksgiving dinner and somebody decides to pray and you got the super spiritual one there and they just jump into it and they're like, I'll take it from here. Okay, and, and, would you say the Thanksgiving prayer? You're a guest at dinner. Can you imagine? You know, have you ever been around those kind of people? Where they're like, I'd love to. And they're like, yeah. right? And, the next thing you know, you're like, oh my God, you know? What just happened? <laughs> they go into warring emergency tongues at Thanksgiving, and you're like, no, bless the food, right? But there's a lot of people that they don't know the on and off button and when that should be. Oh, on? Is on? You know? And so what you got to do is begin to recognize that tongues and interpretations for a public meeting, building yourself up in your most holy faith is what Paul talked about when he said, I thank God I pray in tongues more than you all. When you begin to pray in the Spirit out of Jude, when it says in Jude that you pray in the Spirit, that you're building yourself up, that is where you're investing in the future. So you combine the Word and praying in tongues. And if you'll do that copious amounts of time, until you're changing your thought pattern, until you're changing your inner person, here's what's going to happen. You're going to start hearing God. People are like, no, you need to get my best-selling this or go through my manual and all that, which I have that stuff, but I'll tell you what, this is how you do it. You begin to do that, and you'll begin to get the vision for your life. You'll know what God told you to do, and you'll know where you're supposed to be. That is the simplicity of it. And if you're not sure on top of that, add fasting. Throw a little hot sauce on there. A little fasting. That's kind of an oxymoron, isn't it? Hot sauce and fasting. But if you, if you go ahead and you begin to fast, and you're doing the things I'm telling you, your body's going to be like, yeah and you'll make it submit and you're going to begin to hear God. God is not the one that needs to move. When you fast, you're the one moving. We don't fast to make God do anything. God's word is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's always there. When you fast, you're moving you to line up with God's will for your life. I don't know when this thing came into the body of Christ. Did help us, Jesus. Help us, God. Do something, God, as if he's done nothing. If only we cried just a little bit louder, God might actually have some mercy and just do something. That is not true. God has already done everything he's going to do for us 2,000 years ago on the cross. We got that covenant. We have the promises. We have the written book. We have everything provided for through Jesus. Now all we got to do is line up with it. Does that make sense? And when we're praying and going to war, yes, we're smacking demons around. Yes, we're stopping stuff. But God's will is right there. He's ready to go and do exactly what his word says. So it's us that has to get out of the way or the clutter stopping it in our life. 
That's where prayer comes in. That's when you begin to find your vision. That's when you begin to hit the target. So I'm going to go into just a few things here. So the Lord spoke to us to do these things. We began to do it. Rain's always a sign to us, just so you know. It's always been a sign for us, and it's powerful. Let's go here to Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 3. If you have your Bibles, real quick. You're like, I thought this was a prophetic meeting. You're like opening your Bible. Yep, Habakkuk chapter 2. Let's go there. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 3. And verse 3. Give me an amen if you're with me. It says, for the vision, for the vision is yet for an appointed time. Now, it also says, write the vision, make it plain, that he who reads it may run, right? That's what it's talking about. But verse 3 goes into it, says, for the vision. Everybody say, the vision. The vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Now, here's the part I want to talk to you about. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Now, when you get a word from God, you need to write that thing down. You need to start believing God. You need to start standing on it because God is glorified by you hitting your life's target. Do you know there's some desires that you have inside you that are not evil? Some of you might have a desire that you want to influence people. Do you know that that could actually be a gift from God? Some of you have a desire that you may want to impact a certain people group. Some of you have a desire inside of you that you might have a desire to own a lot of things like land and property and things. I'm telling you that's of God when it's sanctified and through the word of God. Somewhere along the line, we bought this lie as the body of Christ that we're not supposed to have or do or be a part of anything grand. People are like, no, God, you know, God's stuff in envelopes. That's God. I'm going to meddle with this moment. This is going to be fun. (laughs) Have you ever thought about stars? You ever thought about them? How massive a star is? How many of them that there are? All over the sky? Whether you're a round earth or a flat earth, have you ever thought about stars? (laughs) Some of you are like... Come out. Anyway, and so when you're, but when you're, but when you, (laughs) but stars, stars are these giant things that are way out there and you can't even number them all. Do you know how much energy it takes to run a star? Really, I want you to really go here with me for a second. Do you know how much energy it takes to run one star? more than our earth could possibly muster. With all of our combined resources, efforts, technology, anything, you put it all together and you can't even begin to fire a star up. You can't even begin to probably spark a piece of the star. You can't even get it going. Yet here's these gigantic structures, trillions of them out in the cosmos and they have raging, burning energy that is beyond our comprehension. Now here's the question. Why? Why are they there? What is the purpose of all that energy and whatnot? And the answer is for the Lord's pleasure. For his pleasure, he made these things. Now, there may be some wonderful purpose for them, in the age to come that we don't know about in the Word of God, when we're ruling and reigning with Jesus forever and all eternity and we're flying around with angels, you know, I'll have my lightsaber. It's going to be awesome. I'm going to fly to different planets. Yeah, right? You think what you want, I'll think what I want. And be traveling at the speed of thought. I want to see Mars. Let's vacation at Mars, honey. And we'll be there. The weather is very nice on Mars. I don't know. I think this way. I don't know what you guys think. (laughs) But the reason I'm saying this is because why is it 
that God made stars. It's for his pleasure. Then you get asked the question, what is the economic purpose or fiduciary responsibility that God did with that? Is that in his budget? <laughs> did God make stars and he's just kind of like, you know, I, I, very intentional and I did it because, you know, I just really have this purpose for them. Now, you could say, well, there are purposes for the stars. Yes, but trillions of them that we can't even see that are so far away we can't even connect with them. What's the purpose? The answer is, I think the stars are like art to him. He just likes them. Now, I'm saying that on a very big level to bring it down to where you are. There are things that God has put inside of you that he actually wants you to have. And the devil comes along, throws religion in there, perverts the purpose of a thing, and that's when you get into things that are off track and you know, flesh stuff takes you off the, the course. But I'm here to tell you right now, if you can think beyond the way you've thought, but you get in the Word of God with it, I am telling you, God will increase you and break you out of containment. You are meant to own a piece of the rock. You are meant to excel. You are meant to go higher. You are meant to attain what God's called you to do. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and that your fruit would remain. So what are we talking about? When you get into the idea of a vision, when God tells you to do something, behind that vision is never death, destruction, and the end. Okay, I'm going to go to the whiteboard. Is this okay? Everybody with me? This is going to really help you, and I'm going to beat up on that religious thing that's trying to contain you, okay? This is going to be awesome. Thank you, Ray. Let's do this together. As one, as Uncle Lance would say. Here we go. Now, when we're doing, thank you, sir. Very quickly, very briefly, let's just say that this represents your vision, okay? This is something you're looking at, okay? Both prophetically, something God showed you, okay? This works in the prophetic. It also works in, in life and what's going on. You see something, and this is what we would call a revelation, okay? Now... Time goes on, and you realize that you're believing God for something. You're believing for this vision. We could call this, you know, Habakkuk, where it's the vision. Though it tarries, wait for it. It will surely come. you got to stand and stay on the vision. God shows you something. When God begins to show you something, many people think this means right now. Right now. This is going to happen. You're very nearsighted. You see it. But many times the vision will actually manifest far different than how you saw it. it. Might be bigger. Might be beyond what you can ask or think according to the power that works in you. So you're looking at this vision, but then time comes, right? Time. I got to tell you, this happens both in prophetic things. You see something from the Spirit of the Lord. You know you're meant to do it. You know God's showing you something that is to come. Many people immediately get a prophetic word, and they just interpret it on the spot. And they say, this is what's going to happen. And they don't give it time. They don't vet it. They don't walk through it. But that is revelation. Revelatory moments shouldn't be fully interpreted on the spot unless it's a word of knowledge. Does that make sense? If God shows you something about the future you got to recognize there's probably layers to that. There's a Latin word called sensus plenior. It means a deeper, fuller meaning. A deeper, fuller meaning. But if you get a revelation, time begins to happen. This is where people fall into discouragement. They get into all this stuff and say, well, I thought I saw something. I don't think I did. But if you don't faint, and you got to recognize that God wants you to attain what he showed you even more than you do, and you stay on that, stay on that. This is Hebrews 6. Right? Hebrews 6. What is it talking about in Hebrews 6? It says, through faith and patience, you, you attain the promises. Right? So you stay on stuff through time. This is where you spend moments of interpretation. Revelation, interpretation, until finally you get to the place of application and that's where maybe what you saw is a little different than what he showed you. You're working towards it, and you give God the opportunity to navigate you to it. In a spiritual way, if you have a vision of the future, usually your depth reception is off. 
It's hard to actually see what's going on here. So you're only seeing what you were shown, but that's why we have revelation, interpretation, and application. But when we begin to apply over time, not fainting, staying in faith and patience, you will attain the promise God has for you. And I want to say something about this in your vision. God knows you better than you do. He knows you way better than you do. God will give you everything you never knew you wanted. He really will. And by the way, prophetic or prophets in the office of the prophet, their whole job is not to just prophesy to you in the future. Do you know that? Come on, prophet, prophesy. I am. I'm doing it right now. When people say, you know, that's what prophets do. No, prophets, according to Ephesians 4, 11, and 12, it says that we are to edify and equip the body in the gifts of prophecy and to teach you and instruct you in righteousness. People are like, if you're a real prophet, you call people to repentance. Yes and amen. After they've edified and equipped them. I believe very firmly the Spirit of the Lord is saying it's time to begin a, get a right-sizing in our mind, get a right-sizing in our heart, and begin to go forward with all that he's called us to do. I know God called me into media many years ago, and we're just beginning to scratch the surface of it. I didn't even understand what it meant. I was with Jason. Jason and I, Heather and I, and a few of us were in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. We're driving through the streets. Our driver was awesome, man of God, but he drove like a, you know, a race, NASCAR, I, I don't know. Like we're watching, you know, we're hitting speed bumps and like getting air, ah, you know, and we're in the back alleys. It was pretty great. I was hanging on for dear life. And as we're going along, all of a sudden I'm getting real nauseous and I'm hugging my suitcase in the back. I'm like, oh, Jesus, <laughs> this doesn't feel real good. And it's just, meh, meh, meh. It is crazy. And as we're going, suddenly I lean forward and I'm hugging my suitcase. And I'm getting a little bit nauseous. And all of a sudden I go into a vision. Whew. This kind of stuff happens to me. I think the Lord has a sense of humor. <laughs> Young, a sense of humor. Because God will suddenly just, in the most inconvenient moments, take me into a vision. As a matter of fact, I was having somebody, I had to have some stitches. Some stitches one time. You know what I'm talking about? I had, a, I had an opening, I had, a, I had like a cut, and they were doing some stitches, so I'm laying down, right? Heather loves this story. She's there with me. And uh, they're, they're sewing, right? And this person's there, and all of a sudden, I just said, oh, you're a piano player, or something like that. <laughs> and I'm, I'm like in their house, you know? And, and all of a sudden, they're like, Ugh! and they start like vomiting. And I thought, well, that's not good, you know? <laughs> Had to get something taken care of, right? And I'm like, this isn't good, you know? And, and in that moment, all of a sudden, they're like, bleh, bleh, and they run out of the room. And I'm like sitting there, and I got this thing opened up. And I'm like, uh, Jesus. And um, Heather's like, oh, can I help you? And they're like gagging and vomiting. They started manifesting demons when I went into the vision. It was crazy. And, uh, <laughs> and, and as that happened, we're like, it's okay. Come out, you know? And, and um, <laughs> I don't even want to go into how many demon stories I have walking into places. But I'm in this, you know, it's not a very convenient moment. And I'm there and all of a sudden this is happening and I see things. And sometimes when people like they touch me, and this, I don't mean to be weird about it. It doesn't always happen. But sometimes if people touch me and I'm in a space, I just see their life. It's wonderful. And I'm in this place, and this lady's gagging, bleh, bleh. and Heather's just like, oh, you'll be okay, come out. You know? And, and um, when it's all said and done, we got them put back together. They're like, I don't know what happened. We're like, <laughs> and, and it worked out. But the Lord will so many times, the Lord will many times speak to me in the most impromptu, inconvenient moments. And everything came out just fine, and that person was fine, and I was fine, and it was all good. But then also, I've just been in places where I just start to see things visions. They break loose. God shows you stuff. My team gives me a hard time about it because I try to be really disciplined because, you know, most prophets are absolutely in a different planet all the time anyway. <laughs> Prophetic people, you know what I'm talking about? Everything has a meaning. Yeah. Nobody? Yeah. You drive past a billboard, ah, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> absolutely. That was for me, Jesus. 
How about license plates? Anybody? Is there? There's a few. Yeah, numbers, right? When, when we get into numbers, I call Troy Brewer. I'm like, I have no idea what this is about. He's like, bro, let me break it down in crayon for you. I'm like, I'm sorry I'm not you, OK? But, yeah. but God will speak to you at very impromptu moments when it's not convenient. And he likes to do that. I think he has a sense of humor. I really think that. I think the Lord enjoys working through people that, I don't know, just makes them uncomfortable. And with me, there's been many times he'll be like, get up and go tell that person this right now. But when God's speaking to you and you're honing in on your giftings and you're beginning to train those gifts, God will begin to form your vision. He'll show you where you're meant to go. And he desires for you to excel and increase even more than you do. This is so important. It's so important that you begin to know that God has a destiny for you. There's dreams and visions he's put inside of you, and he is not small. And religion and the world, especially the devil's system, hell's economy, it wants you to think small, act small, be small, do nothing. People say, I want to win millions to Jesus. Well, you better expand your vision. You're going to need a lot of help to do it. When I realized I couldn't fulfill the call of God in my life without expanding the vision God gave me, and I also realized it was on me to do that. Write the vision. Make it plain. That he who reads it may run. It has to be so simple that in an elevator speech, if somebody asks you, what do you do? You don't say, well, <laughs> it all started when I was three. <laughs> Amen? Amen? That's why we say a million for a billion. Oh, what does that mean? That's my vision. Disciples through media, and you drop down from there, and you start expanding the vision. God is calling many of you to go higher than you've ever gone before. I'll yeah. say it even more aggressive. God needs you to do that. Amen. God needs you to prosper. God needs you to increase. He needs you to start thinking like an owner. He needs you to start thinking like someone that's going to run this place not be on the receiving end of a fallen world. He needs you to think bigger. I want to tell you about an amazing opportunity that has just been presented to us. We've had a supernatural door of opportunity open for us. Only God could do what is happening for this ministry right now. And it is involving television, network television, satellite television, going all over the world. Now, there's a lot in store for this, but let me explain. This is a word God's given us to reach a billion people for the gospel. And I feel an urgency for this coming year to advance and go forward because of the uniqueness of what God has spoken in this ministry and through this ministry in media. And here's what we have to do. To accomplish this, we not only have to buy the airtime, but we have to build out a call center and finish this building. And we are in the middle of it right now, but the timeline has just been sped up to fall time so we can be ready for the first of the year when we're gonna to begin to launch out in television in a monumental way. Now we've had an opportunity that is both fiscally responsible and financially amazing the way God has done this for us. And we have to take opportunity right now with it because it won't last long. So here's what I'm asking you. Would you consider supporting us helping us build out the call center, helping us finish off this building, and helping us with the budget of airtime. And it is gonna be a monumental thing, and the Lord has given us favor, and I can't wait to tell you more and more about it. But if you would consider partnering today over this, I know we can hit this target, I know we can walk through the door, and I know we can raise up a million to go win a billion. And I'm telling you, this is a God moment. It's a now word. And I'm asking you if you consider partnering with us over it. Maybe you want to become a partner, or if you are a partner, maybe you'd consider increasing your partnership today or giving a one-time offering. This is an amazing open door for this ministry and this broadcast. Everything we've prayed about, everything the Lord has told us to do is now coming to this monumental moment. Next year, we're going to reach the masses like never before, but we need your help. Please consider going to josephz.com right now and supporting this amazing open door. Thank you so very much. Well, you know, we're so excited to share that 
uh, Joseph Z is now a programmer on Daystar. And his show, Voice of God, is dedicated to prophetic jour journalism and faith-filled Bible teaching for the last days. You'll hear unique commentary and biblical teachings that will empower you to see the world through a watchman's lens so you'll know what's coming and what to do about it. And of course, this program debuts this Thursday at 10 p.m. Mark that down. Those of you that love Joseph, and uh, that's 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And here's a look at what you can expect. I'm Joseph Z, and at the age of nine, I had a life-altering encounter with the voice of God. Throughout my life, I discovered God is always speaking. The question is, are you listening? There's a difference between the office of the prophet and the gift of prophecy. Simply put, the office of the prophet is a responsibility to a segment of the body of Christ. You see that in Ephesians 4, verse 11, 12, and 13. Office gifts are there to edify and equip the body, where when you look at different abilities in the body, such as the gift of prophecy, there's not an assignment to the segment of the body. It's not a responsibility. It's just a gift that a person in the body carries. When a person with a gift of prophecy has a responsibility put on them for the body of Christ, a certain section of believers, they are called to step into that with responsibility. That's the difference between the office of the prophet and the gift of prophecy. All right, I'm excited about that, aren't you? Absolutely. Joseph, Joseph is a great teacher. I love listening to him. Personal friend, and it's going to be, you're going to be encouraged. 